the sustainability management master's program you are answering one simple question do you care about your future generation you know if you care about your kids their kids their grandkids then you care about sustainability and a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world we have both part time and full time students our curriculum is 30 hours instead of thesis we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job but at the same time sustainability is not always everything about environment it also relates to the business they will take a sustainable business strategies course they will take a project management course most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure they will have to have a sustainability office if you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact thanks doc thanks tips um thank you for coming out appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here uh we met at the at the uh conference last year in may um over at ngit and uh we we got the talking and i heard that they said there was a a program involving uh sustainability and uh invited me to to come talk to you about it so uh i put together i put together some uh some things i thought that might be interesting uh to you um this is about all of you it's not really about me um if you have questions as we go through it please ask i'm not going to do this whole wait until the end thing because by then like we forget what they are just raise your hand and i'll try to answer it um so to get started this is about sustainability consulting uh for nonprofit community development and land preservation organization it's a long long title basically over the years i've had the privilege and the honor to be able to work with some organizations particularly in new jersey that have been involved in land development uh uh land preservation and community development i shouldn't say land development although they some of them do that um so uh we'll just jump right in because i think i'm probably going to have to work really hard to do this in a good way. I'm not going to go into the triple bottom line. You probably heard of that in your courses. You know, this is like the mandatory slide for all sustainability for all set right. So I thought I would just acknowledge that and say, yeah, here it is. Let's move on. In practice, in practice, what is sustainability? You know, you're all thinking I'm going to get out and make a great job. I'm going to work for J&J, I'm going to work for, you know, DuPont or or a consulting firm and and the reality is that sustainability is such a broad term it's very hard to say what it what what it really encompasses but as a practice as a practical matter all the things that we do in the environmental field generally fall under the rubric of sustainability so energy conservation air emissions you can read uh, the, the slide renewable energy wind solar geothermal water conservation lead all of these things that we do on a daily basis in industry and in business and in consulting firms kind of fall under the rubric of sustainability We talk about nonprofits why is that important? Well, a nonprofit is organized uh specifically t- to benefit the public, not to benefit a particular private uh shareholder or individual. Um they can't influence legislation, they can't lobby. You know, they can't go down to Washington and say, you know, fix this law, fix that law. That's what they hire lobbyists. Um they can be ta- they can receive donations. Um and they have a mission. And 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 there's a theme in my presentation about mission. which which kind of underlies everything that 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 I'm going to talk about the mission the mission is why 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 does my organization exist what does it do stevens has a mission i don't know what it is but i think it probably is something about creating uh 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 educating individuals in the practice of uh uh engineering and other other sciences and 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 i don't i'm embarrassing myself but i'm sure it's on the website Uh, but that would be the mission of the organization and that's important because an organization needs outside entities like consultants like 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 all of you one day um to give advice and direction to provide services um to uh try to facilitate uh donations from from parties and why is land preservation uh important to a nonprofit well there are nonprofits that carry out land preservation activities I'm trying to create this link here for you. Um 
as I'm, I have four examples of, of, of projects that, that, that pertain to this. Why do we preserve land? Because preserve land gives us access to recreation. It prevents our taxes from increasing because preserve land doesn't need police. It doesn't need fire. It doesn't need all the services. It doesn't need natural gas and schools. It doesn't send kids to school. Um, so there are lots of advantages to preserving land. Um, there are a lot of issues that go into land preservation by nonprofits that they need help from outside parties. Uh, legal and regulatory process, buying the property, negotiations over contracts, indemnities. Um, a property in a small town, people might want to know, this, they're called stakeholders, how can I use this property? Is this going to be open to me? Can I walk my dog? Can I go for a run? Can I take my kids there? Can we go sledding? Um, environmental issues and environmental due diligence. How does, that, how does that nonprofit know what kind of issues they're going to be encountering when they buy the property? Funding and financing, very important. How am I going to finance the acquisition of this property? And finally, how am I going to use this land? These are all things that go into the land preservation process that nonprofits have to think about. A little bit about environmental due diligence. Has anybody had experience doing phase ones? Oh, what's this? Are we connected to the internet? Because there's some kind of some kind of ad thing here. Should I click the a little X there, or is it going to blow up? She talked the phase one process. Did she go into details at all, a little bit? All right. I didn't touch anything. I swear I didn't touch it. I was just standing here talking, and it, it got mad at me or something. So I'm going to go. Has anybody, been, has anybody seen or been involved with the creation of a phase one report besides, besides the doctor? OK. All right. Well. When we acquire property, we want to identify what the environmental problems are. What are the liabilities that you may find? Are there buried drums? Is, have there been spills? Um, was something on the property before that, that, that may have caused a problem? So we do a report called a phase one environmental assessment. Um, in New Jersey, we call it a preliminary assessment. And that's a whole different talk. I'll be happy to come in and tell you about the differences between those reports. Um, but basically, the reason we do it is because the government says that if I buy a property and there's a problem there and I don't look first, then if something comes up later, and I, like, like let's say there's 100 buried drums that are leaking, I can't claim that I'm innocent if I didn't do the initial phase one investigation. And so we go through this process on behalf of these nonprofits to help them look at properties and figure out what might be there. In the case of one property I'm going to talk about, the phase one and, the, and, the, and that process was required in order for the state to help provide funding to actually acquire the property. So what do we do as part of a phase one? Really quick, we look at the history of the site. We ask people what, what went on there. Uh, we find old people who knew about the property many, many years ago. We look at old photographs, aerials, topographic maps, sandborns, old things like archives. We look at aerials. This is an actual property that I helped a, a nonprofit acquire. Um, you see, if you look on the right-hand side, it used to be agricultural on a part of it. It actually, uh, it still is part of it. Is, most of it is forested. I might look at 15 of these using Google Earth and other sources and find out that, oh, you know what? In 1936, there was a building on the property, and they made hats. Well, hat makers use mercury. Well, maybe I've got a mercury problem here. Well, if that building was knocked down or, or, or was demolished, in 1950, and in 30 years through succession, the vegetation grew back. I may never know it's there unless I go back and I do that due diligence, unless I go back and I look. Topographic maps, this is a map from, I think, 1913 or 1915. So we look at the site. We figure out where it is. Maybe there was a building there. We want to know. This is something really cool. In 1998, this is an actual uh, topographic map of a site in Bergen County. If I look, there's a lake on the left side. There's a lake. And then it's all red there. That means it was developed. If I go back to 1963, that was an orchard. Orchards are notorious for leaving arsenic behind. 
um, that were used to uh, uh, to spray to prevent uh, apple worms and from other other uh, other other pests. Also, there was no lake there, just the stream. So somebody must have dammed it sometime between '63 and, and '98. So this is the kind of process that we have to go through in order to help uh, entities figure out. This is a really cool one. Um, on the left, well, I'll just start on the right side. On the right side, in 1970, and it's still there today, is a beautiful housing development. This is in central New Jersey. I won't tell you where it is. On the left side, that's what the site looked like 20 years earlier. That was a plant where they used to creosote railroad ties. And in the circle, I was called out to go to somebody's house because they had oil in their basement, and they didn't know where it was coming from. And we went back and we looked at the photos and said, there's a pond in your yard. What do you mean? Well, there's a pond, and it looks to me like this is some kind of manufacturing plant. Turns out they were, they were soaking railroad ties in creosote. Um, and that was a, this is a creosote lagoon. Uh, this became a $100 million Superfund site. Um, and uh, there's a company out there that's not happy that I found it. Um, but at the end of the day, it was remediated, and everybody got their houses back, and the houses were rebuilt. But this is an example of why you want to know what's on a property before I acquire it. This is a, I found, I just happened to find this. Um, this is where I live. Um, this is a, uh, an old 1700s uh, that, that identified who was there. And we don't normally go back that far, but as an example, if you did have a property, there's lots of sources of, of, of information to go back and look at. Now, the second part of a uh, due diligence is we go, we look at the property. What's at the property? Well, we look for areas of concern, old tanks. Uh, if it was an old farm, were they applying pesticides? Were they storing pesticides? Uh, what we love to find are farm dumps. You know, you're walking through the woods and you see a big pile of stuff. That's a farm dump because anybody, anybody with a piece of property has a farm dump. And there's tires and there's old cars and there's sometimes drums and contamination. Um, and we want to know if it's there because they could be a very expensive problem to fix. Um, often surface, surface spills, landscaping, all, debris, all kinds of things. Also safety issues, starting at the bottom. Dogs and, uh, frankly, sometimes homeless and trespassers need to be careful. Um, old septic tanks, you know, you got to watch out. You can fall into a septic tank and nobody would find you. Um, old wells, old dug wells. You know, very often somebody would put a t take a piece of plywood, put it over an old dug well. Well, plywood and the rain don't really mix. Anybody who knows construction, what happens when plywood gets wet? You go, you put your foot through it, you go down. So there's a lot of safety issues that we have to deal with as well that are really a separate presentation. So this is a site, an actual property that I looked at. Very bucolic, beautiful, rolling up the hay. It's very nice. That's the same property, different part. It's hilly, different geology, very rocky. It's an old structure on the property. And lo and behold, here's a tank. We found a tank. Somebody took an old underground tank and threw it there. Here's a pile of debris, pipes. Looks like a cylinder or some kind of a transformer, some tires. There's an old dug well. This isn't, this is, I got that from the internet. But uh, just an example of what it might look like, or an old septic tank. Now, if that was overgrown and you were by yourself, you could, you, could, you could fall in. It could be a really serious problem. Be covered in poo or drown. Um, I'm going to go into a couple of examples of actual projects um, that, that I got involved with. Uh, the DNR Greenway is an organization based out of Princeton. Um, their mission is to acquire and preserve property so that the public can use it. And, it's, and they want to acquire properties on what, what are called greenways. And a greenway is, a, is, a, is an area that basically is an unbroken area of, for lack of a better term, green. Uh, say a ridge, a stream corridor, a mountain, a river, where wildlife can move without being, you know, you know for example, if I'm a, if I'm a uh, certain animals don't want to cross a farm field. It makes them vulnerable to predators. So they want to stay in the woods. Bears, deer, a lot of animals are like that. So you want to create a, a, a pathway for, for wildlife. Also, it provides access for recreation. And then once you 
connect all these greenways. This is Western New Jersey. Uh, if, you, if you guys have been out to uh, Lambertville or New Hope or, or Flemington, this is the area that we're talking about here. Um, the idea to connect all these greenways so that people, people and wildlife can use them. And the dark properties that the UNR Greenway is preserved, all the other green are just other, other properties that have been preserved using other avenues. Now, I, if anybody's into hiking, nothing frustrates me more than going on a three-mile loop hike somewhere. It's like, that was it? Now, I want to be able to, I want to, be able to go on a straight line for like you know, 20 miles. Um, so like, I, like we can do that now from Lambert. If anybody knows, Lambertville to Washington Crossing, you can do 12 miles, single track. You can trail run it. You can walk it, whatever. Um, the idea is that you should be able to use these greenways for that kind of purpose, not just wildlife, but also for recreation. And, and so DNR Greenway, you know, you'll be driving down the road, and there'll be a new trail crossing and a new parking lot for a property that they just acquired. It's a really a wonderful organization. So this is, this is a big property. Uh, I say big because it's a big property, about 350 acres um, in Hopewell Borough, uh, which is near where I live. Um, that's a view from the property. St. Michael's was an orphanage on 350 acres. It was run by the Diocese of Trenton. Um, it was demolished in, in the 1960s, and eventually uh, the property was leased to farmers, and there was like a, a lot of properties, there was development pressure. Um, and that, you know, once there's development pressure, people get interested in preserving it. Like, oh no, I'm gonna have another 500 kids in my school system, and oh, my taxes are gonna go up, and all this. And so the idea was, let's put together, you know, DNR Greenway and some others got together and said, let's figure out how we can acquire this property. One of the things I like to do is Look at really cool old buildings. This was actually the orphanage that was on the property. They don't, we don't make, we don't build buildings like that anymore. You know, that, that's, I mean, it, it's a shame that now it's rubble in the, in the old basement. Um, but that's what it looked like. And uh, there's a lot of stories that the locals talk about how the, the local churches would bring the kids in and, and, the, uh, and, and the, the women would braid their hair and they would help them do things. And it was a really kind of an interesting place. But, this is a map showing the outline of the project in, in yellow. Um, it's a trail map, so it shows all the current and proposed trails. It's about a five and a half mile loop all around the edges. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful site. Um, 2010, about 900 donors uh, were, were financed it, about $11 million acquisition. Funding came from uh, not just private donors, but the county, from the locals, from NJDEP's Green Acres, from the State Agricultural Development Commission, or the SADC, um, which which preserves farmland. So we have all these, we have all these parcels, parcels, parcels here and here and here and here, and they were all preserved under different, under a, a lot of different mechanisms. So one parcel may have been SADC. So for example, the parcel that's farmed largely farmed as SADC, the other parcels may have been green acres. And the reason it's important is because you have this kind of patchwork of, of, of funding sources that have to be put together. We had to do the phase one and the due diligence in order to satisfy the New Jersey DEP because they weren't going to fund it until they knew that there wasn't some kind of you know, hazardous waste site on the property, and of course there wasn't. Since this is a uh, sustainability program, I had to talk a little bit about the plant communities. Um, <laughs> to give you some idea, you know, farm fields, there's a, there's a, there's a stream corridor that goes through it. There's hedgerows. Um, this is actually an aerial view looking north. Um, I mean, this is a rolling property. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, when you're there, you say to yourself, wow, like this could have been another 300 houses. Um, and what a relief that you know this organization got together and found the resources to to, to preserve it, because now I can drive home from work and go there and do a five mile trail run or or, or a ten if I want to go around twice, and it's just absolutely marvelous. Um, and the locals can can walk right out of town, walk their dog, um, use it for recreation, 
Um, they, have, they have neighborhood campouts. They have different other activities. It's also used as an educational farm. For those of you that have been out to Howell Farm out in uh, um, uh, near the old Bell Mountain ski area, for the, no one knows that, I bet, um, out, in, uh, out going toward Lamberville, um, you know, you have these different, different events like maple sugaring and, you know, making apple cider and things like that. That's what the organization really, really tries to do. So what did I do for them? Well, as part of the initial development plan, there was a consultant who had taken some samples and done some work and found some problems, um, which in reality were not really problems. And we had to go and kind of figure out uh, uh, whether there really was an environmental problem or not. There were some areas that we had to test. There were some barns. There were some historic pesticide concerns because it was farmed. It turns out there weren't any. Uh, there was concerns about groundwater. Groundwater was fine. Um, there were some storage areas for some materials. They were fine. Um, there were actually two really big farm dumps that another consultant had to investigate and clean up. So they actually had to excavate. And this was thousands of cubic yards of material um, that, that had trees on it. And that's how old the waste was. Um, there, was, there were glass bottles from when the orphanage, you know, from like the 1920s, you know, because a lot of these glass bottles had dates on them. And, and there was just, you know, 65 years of baby, you know, baby food jars, um, you know, in, in these dumps. And anyway, there, was, there were also contaminants that had to be removed because PCBs, PAHs, certain other organics are found in printing ink in bags, in, in bread bags, in the ink, um, in upholstery. Um, and then when it all decomposes and degrades and ends up in a big pile and you take a sample of it and you run it through a GC, it comes up contaminated. And so the underlying soils and groundwater weren't contaminated. It was just the, the stuff sitting on top. But that had to be removed. And so um, we, we helped oversee that process that another firm did. And eventually, we had to uh, work with them to negotiate an environmental responsibility between buyer and seller. We had to get it done fast because the state money had a, had, had a deadline on it. Um, we had to get the uh, no further action approval from the DEP in time so that the DEP Green Acres can actually, could actually uh, 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 cut the check you know, for, the, for, the, for the project. And there were a, a lot of private donors, including the Johnson family, you know, from the Johnson and Johnson uh, legacy, um, that, you know, uh, you know, private donors get impatient. You know, they want to make sure that this project's going to go. And very often, private donors in the nonprofit world um, want to, they want to don they want to donate in a particular tax year. You know, you want to take your, your deduction, say, in 2017. I don't want to write you a check in 2018. I want it to be 2017. Anyway, and so uh, there were a lot of challenges in order to get this, get this project done. And ultimately, whoops, sorry. Ultimately, it did get done. And now we have this amazing, amazing opportunity uh, today. And I invite anybody who, who goes out toward uh, Hopewell, Lambertville, that area. It's definitely worth, 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 a, worth a stop. Second example, um, the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Association. Um, this, is a, a, this is an organization um, uh, that, again, has a mission, which is to keep water clean. And their, their area of, of interest is the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed, which is in green. And, ex and it's big. It extends from uh, all the way out near West Amwell, down all the way over to Millstone, down in Monmouth uh, and, and uh, I guess Monmouth County, all the way up to where the millstone empties into the Raritan. Um, and what they do is they help acquire properties. They acquire property directly. They also try to influence um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the process of environmental regulation to, to be supportive of uh, actions that are going to be protective of, protective of water quality. They have a really cool uh, base camp in Pennington, uh, which, again, just like 
the other property I talked about is this wonderful, you know, uh, I'm not sure how many acres it is, but it's two miles north to south. Wonderful trails, wonderful uh, public access. Um, it's, 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 it's along the Stony Brook and goes all the way up to Hopewell. Um, and, and why is this important? It's part of the Greenway concept. Just a little picture of the Stony Brook. Um, what do I do for them? Well, over the years, I've done due diligence for them to help acquire the properties. Um, as part of the, the little base camp I told you about, they built a really cool visitor center that I'll talk about next where we got involved in starting a geothermal array and a lot of uh, sustainable components, a lot of lead components. It's a lead platinum building. Um, I helped them with some general consulting around some regional groundwater quality issues. Um, there are some groundwater problems in the general area that they were concerned about. Um, and just other things that come up where I get a phone call and say, hey, Jeff, you know, can you help me with this? So this is an $11 million a new visitor center, nature center, uh, again, open to the public. I to go. It's a wonderful, but that, you know, Dibs, that would be a really cool field trip. Yeah. If you if you wanted to, we can do that. If any, if you, $11 it was $11 million to build the, the, the nature center. Um, it's got a lot of lead, lead elements, the green roof, uh, solar hot water, and photovoltaic, both. Uh, they, they rainwater harvest. They have uh, very good lighting for passive lighting. There's almost no artificial lighting in the building, except obviously at night. Uh, rain gardens uh, for groundwater recharge. They have a constructed wetland for nitrification, denitrification. So they have full wastewater treatment uh, on site, which percolates to the groundwater. A lot of DEP permitting was involved. One of the things that I got involved with with this project, uh, some, please. Where? Um, uh, an hour and hour and a half. Yeah. Yep. I'll I'll send you this. I'll, I'll send you their information. Um, one of the components of of, of this was ge the, the geothermal system, and uh, you know geothermal is by its nature expensive because you've got to construct infrastructure in order to uh, create the heat transfer capabilities with the ground. I'm assuming that everybody knows about geothermal power. Uh, I don't want to go into the, the, the weeds too much on, on that. Um, but essentially, we had to locate a, a vertical system, a well field, in an area that had some groundwater concerns. And so one of the issues that we had to deal with is, are we going to be circulating groundwater from, from different depths that may impact another depth. And that's called communication between aquifers. I don't know if anybody's had hydrogeology or any groundwater courses, but we, we don't want to have potentially contaminated groundwater from one zone getting sucked up into another zone. And so there's, there's different types of systems that geothermal uh, technology involves. Uh, The two, the two basic systems are closed loop and open loop. And what that means is you either withdraw the groundwater from the ground, run it through a heat exchanger, transfer the heat from the ground to the building in the winter, or transfer the heat from the building to the ground in the summer. And you, you're using the ground as a, as, a, as, a, as a sink or as a source it, it, uh, to absorb heat. Um, but if you can't pump groundwater in and out for some reason, like maybe there isn't any or there isn't enough in certain bedrock formations, you go with a closed loop system. And what a closed loop system is, it's a, instead of pumping water, you're actually pumping an antifreeze mixture down into the well, not into the well, but in a closed, in a closed pipe that goes, it's called a U-tube, not the website, but it's called a U, it's shaped like a U, um, my favorite website. You go down, it's 450 feet, comes right back up, and the well itself is grouted uh, with a heat with a special grout that that is conductive and allows heat to be transferred in and out of the aquifer, in and out of the formation. Um, and so we went through a whole process of design where we had to figure out what the most appropriate 
technology would be for this site, and it turns out it was closed loop. Um, and so a closed loop system was actually constructed. There's another technology, which is kind of in the middle, which is called standing column, where, where you may have groundwater, but not enough to pump, because you'll, you'll cause the well to go dry. Um, but there's enough to serve as a conductive medium, uh, I should say convective medium, and then conductive with the ground. I think that's right. Um, I'm at a college. I have to make sure I get that correct. Um, but uh, the, uh, and then there's advection we throw in, too. I'm glad Dr. Vicari isn't here. He would, he'd, <laughs> he'd set me straight. Um, the, uh, uh, but the standing column is used when, when, when the conditions uh, justify it. In general, you could have a loop that is horizontal in the ground. You can have a loop which is vertical, which are the wells I just described. Or another, another layout. For example, people have used ponds. You actually run the closed loop into a pond, and the pond serves as the source of heat or the sink for the heat. Um, I, I did this kind of backwards. I apologize. Um, there's economic considerations when you construct a geothermal array. They're expensive. They, 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 a lot of capital expense. Is, my, is the savings and energy cost going to justify the capital expense when natural gas is so cheap or when oil is relatively inexpensive as compared to how it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago? Um, what, are, what are my aquifer properties? These are all the things that need to be looked at as part of the design of these systems. At the end of the day, the closed loop was constructed. It's operable. One of the things I want to find out is how it's working in terms of economics. Um, I will say this in general. Um, a lot of not, a, a projects that get built that are not necessarily going to have the same, they're not going to have the payback uh, characteristics that corporate America might want. So for example, if you work for a company, and a big part of sustainability is What's my payback on a particular project? Is it one year? Is it two years? A lot of companies want like six month or one year payback on new investments. Maybe they'll go two years or three years, depending upon you know the very you know depending upon the project. Um, is a company going to do a twenty year payback? I I don't know. But as a nonprofit, or if, if I'm doing a demonstration project where I want to show the the benefits of the technology, you know maybe I have donors that are interested in. In, in building a system because they want to show that it can be done and that it could be better than, than using fossil fuels, for example. Um, so th that remains to be seen, and, and, and we'll see how that goes. Third example, um, IELTS is an organization out of Trenton. IELTS was founded by a guy named Marty Johnson, who, a Princeton grad, who decided he wanted to better the city of Trenton and started an organization called IELTS, which fosters as it says, uh, self-reliant families, healthy communities. They get involved in everything from job training to acquisition of uh, decrepit properties for you know, the Habitat for Humanity, what they do. It's very similar. They have a, a group called Youth Build that uh, takes troubled youth, at-risk youth, those that have been in the system, teach them construction, HVAC, and then they have them actually work on these properties that, that got redeveloped. It's a really wonderful organization. And I've been lucky enough to be able to, to help them in different ways, looking at properties, helping them around due diligence. Um, not something that I've worked on, but the firm that I was with and, and uh, uh, one, of our, one, of our, uh, one of our principals was on the board. And so we, we got involved with a couple of different things, one of which was residential energy management. You know, a lot of lower income folks live in very leaky homes. They end up paying a lot for, for heat. Um, there also, there's also public programs that like PSE and G would offer to help assist with, um, with, with fuel costs. But at the same time, the, you're pumping money in to a, to a leaky home. Um, isn't it better to correct the HVAC components of the residents? So it, it, was a look, it was taking a holistic look at how aisles could help local residents with this, with this particular problem. And then other things that we did around, uh, around another site, that's my next, my next example, which is the coolest one. Um, I worked on a site called 33 Tucker, which was an old paint warehouse. 
Um, and you can imagine a paint warehouse may have some problems, uh, may have some environmental problems. Um, this is what it looks like today. Uh, I got involved because they were installing utilities for the renovation, and they found an underground storage tank. Oops, just inside that garage door. Um, it had leaked. There was gasoline in the soil. It had to be cleaned up. Uh, so we took care of that, or, help, or help, helped advise them, and they hired a contractor, and they took care of it. As part of that, we found other things that had to be addressed on the environmental side in the building. There was some soil and groundwater issues. Uh, there was a boiler room. There was some pits. Uh, there was an off-site source of groundwater contamination. Um, there's a, you're all familiar with vapor, vapor, vapor intrusion, the, the organic chemicals in the groundwater, wet off gas, you know, Henry's Law, all that. Well, you end up with, uh, with a concentration of, say, benzene or chlorinated hydrocarbons entering the foundation and then becoming an exposure risk for, for occupants. Um, we don't have that in this building, but we do have it underneath the slab. And so there's a state requirement that we actually monitor uh, every year for the possibility that there might be vapor intrusion at the property. And then as a, as a licensed site remediation professional, which is also called the LSRP, that's what I am in New Jersey, um, I got to write the letter that said everything is done, the site is clean. And I, got, I wrote that in 2015 under the newly privatized LSRP program, um, which was uh, passed by the state in 2012. Uh, this is the coolest one. Um, Isles also acquired a property uh, in, in cooperation with a local developer uh, who actually, not only, not only this site, but acquired several other sites, and this is down in Hamilton. Um, there, who's been to Grounds for Sculpture down in Hamilton? You have. Isn't it cool? Yeah, anybody who hasn't been there, go there. It's like, it's not, it's, it's really, really cool. I mean, there's a lot of sculptures over like 40 acres, and there's a really good restaurant there, and you could do a really nice, really nice day there. But Grounds for Sculpture, as well as a lot of local artists, have really began to turn Hamilton into this kind of artsy core. Um, if you ever drive around Mercer County, there's, there's these bowls, these ceramic, big ceramic bowls that are painted all different colors. Has anybody seen those? You're all from up here, so uh, that, that's like that's like Ohio, um, you know. I guess, but if you're driving around Mercer County, just keep your eyes open. Route 31, like coming out of Trenton, uh, Route 518, you'll see a you'll see like a bowl, like painted all funny colors or with like sparkles on it or like, uh, um, you know, it's like uh, one of your kids took Elmer's glue and a bunch of arts and craft supplies and like threw it at it. Um, there's like 25 or 30 of these scattered throughout. Um, you'll be driving down the road in Hamilton, and you'll see you'll you'll just see a sculpture. Um, so it's it's it, it, there's a, there's a culture that's been developing around the arts down there, which is really kind of cool. And so the idea was, let's let's take this decrepit, old, abandoned former textile mill, which is right along the the Northeast Corridor tracks. Um, it's got beautiful interior. Um, and let's turn it into a combination business and, sh and social nonprofit center. Let's bring in artists. Let's bring in nonprofits. Let's bring in some private business as tenants. And, and let's redevelop this property. Half of it is under private ownership and is, and is being used, I think, for offices. And that's the intent. The other part of it, the main part, kind of off to the right, shaped like an arrow, um, is, is a nonprofit part. So, there was a, uh, a grant provided by the feds. Um, and there's a little bit of history here. 1895, it was built. 1907, it was sold. Atlantic Products made luggage. I mean, I don't have to go into all that. Early 1980s, it fell into disuse. 2006, the partnership was formed. Redevelopment started about 2008. There was a study that was commissioned using a federal grant, about a half a million dollars. There was a, uh, so, uh, Dr. Bob, Robert Harris, a uh, friend of mine, former uh, one of the founders of Environ International Corporation, actually. Bob, uh, Bob was a, a Princeton professor. 
And he and one of my other colleagues from Environ taught a course on environmental engineering at Princeton. And as what the course was, was developing a sustainability plan for this property. Um, and what are the things that could be done at this property to create as, as, as sustainable as possible a situation? How do I go fossil fuel free? How do I go net zero carbon? How do I go net zero energy? How do I, you know, how do I conserve water? You know, how do I do all of this? And what the students were asked to do, and this was an undergraduate engineering class, they were put into groups and they, and, and under the mentorship of, of Bob and, and Kevin, um, attacked each individual part. So one group looked at the green roof. One group looked at rainwater harvesting. Do we do it by bioswells? Do we harvest it using a tank under the roof? Once I get it into the tank, how do I distribute it now to the toilets or to irrigation? What's the cost of doing that? What's the payback time? Um, what's the cost of replacing windows that had to be replaced you know, for passive lighting needs? Is it worth it? Um, what kind of windows? Double pane, triple pane, how do I insulate them? Um, do I, should I have solar? Is it worth it? Um, I only have X square footage on the roof. Um, does it make sense from a financial perspective? Um, should I do solar or hot water? Um, can I reuse materials? Um, the approach was to try to go lead, get a lead certification, maybe gold. Um, at the end of the day, it was just not going to be efficient or cost effective to do that. Um, you're t you know, lead is really something, and, and I'm not a lead expert, except lead was developed really for new construction. Now there's a, I think there's a lead certification for um, for retrofitting old structures, or or there or there's going to be. I, I'm not exactly sure, but it's very difficult and expensive to retrofit an old structure to meet. You know, to try to attain a lot of these these uh, these goals. This just kind of shows you the uh, kind of what the layout would look like. Of course, I had to put the Jimi Hendrix picture in there for all of you. Um, there were some challenges here. Uh, the site conditions may not have been optimal for for some technologies. Um, the geology. I, I know that there were issues with geothermal. It would have been very 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 expensive. And we looked at geothermal. Um, I think there were also issues with groundwater quality from a nearby manufacturing plant. Um, the payback was going to be too long. The neighborhood itself really wasn't ready. You know, when you go through a neighborhood, you know, the neighborhood, you know, there's kind of a turning point where people want to be, want to come back in. Um, there really hadn't been enough investment in the neighborhood to justify that kind of expenditure. Um, it probably is still not quite there yet, um, whereas other parts of Trenton and Hamilton are, are maybe are closer. And it's not really walkable um, from, from the train station. Um, and so if you're talking about attracting all of you from Hoboken or somebody who wants to take mass transit and, and go to the office, it's, it's, it has some difficulties. Um, <laughs> I love Gumby. I tried, it took me like 15 minutes searching images to find like kind of a reward. I kept putting in reward under image, like Yahoo images and Google, and I finally found one that I, I liked. Um, I'm not big on like stupid animations in, in these talks, like, like, Comics where people read the comic, you know, and then they all wait for you to laugh. Um, but but we talk we talk about rewards. Um, when I work with these organizations, um, you know, we all get up in the morning, we go to work, we we or we go to school, we do our homework, we write a report, we bang out an essay. Um, but what are we doing, right? You know, we say to ourselves, "Yeah, I'd love to be doing something for somebody." Um, well, I've been really, really lucky and able to, to, to say, you know what, like, like I can go running and hope well and know that I helped, you know, I helped my little small part, my little cog in the system, I was able to help get that property done. I mean, I didn't donate, a, a, you know, $5 million to get it done, but maybe because of something that I did, I helped, I helped get that accomplished. Or maybe with the Stony Brook, um, 
you know, maybe something that we did, you know, uh, helped, you know, school kids, you know, have a better time, you know, you know, maybe learn something about the environment. Um, and so, you know, after the St. Michael's property was redeveloped, they had their, they had their trail run and they had the little run for the kids, which was really cool. Um, you know, it's, and you get to have, you know, the opportunity to invite the community in to see what, you know, to see what is going on there. You know, the watershed had their annual 5K run at their, at their base camp. And I, I told them, I said, you guys really should do 10K because you have the room and why not? Don't just do a 5K twice. It, who runs? Come on, that's it? Come on, all right. Who trail runs? Trail running, is, that's where it's at. Um, why do a 5K twice? You want to be able to, you know, use, you know, you, you got this great property. So I, I said to them, please, you know, let's do a 10K. And I don't know whether they listened to me or they just decided it amongst themselves, but they had a great 10K race last, last June um, and uh, still wasn't long enough, in my opinion. But I guess the best part, you know, I was invited to the commencement ceremony for the Youth Build Group. Um, this is in connection with the Isles 33 Tucker property with all the environmental problems where we helped clean it up. Um, and, you know, they invited me to the commencement at Mercer County Park. And, you know, it's just nice, you know, to be able to go there and, and just see these, see these kids. And not, not just kids, but young adults who have had really, like, really rough in many cases, really rough upbringing, um, end up you know with a with a with a education and a job and a and a future which they may not have had before, and so that's why you know that's one of the reasons I I, I like to do this stuff. So that's 45 minutes. I'm I'm proud and I, I appreciate the opportunity to come in. So thank you very much.